Hey guys, Dr. Scott Nall here from TheVillageOsteopath.com. Today what we're going to be talking about is the coronavirus, COVID-19 as it's being called here. Today it is uh, March 16th, 2020. And I just want to give you some updates on the virus. I haven't really spoken out about this at all this year or during this time. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation, kind of a lot of uh, um, <clears throat> hype on the news. Uh, and so I just want to kind of been wading through a lot of this, trying to figure out what's true, what's not true. And also just give you some just advice on what to do, especially if you're a patient of mine, what you know our protocol is and, and as far as that goes. So the first thing, um, let's just talk about some of the symptoms of the virus, okay? So just like any other flu-type virus, you're just going to get flu-like symptoms. So symptoms can be things like fever, uh, body aches, uh, sniffles, cough, shortness of breath, or you might have it and have no symptoms at all. Uh, that's really exciting, isn't it? So once again, very vague, very, um, very nebulous so it could be really anything. Um, so I'm going to divide this up into two groups of people. We'll do three groups of people. One, people who aren't symptomatic at all. Number two, people who do have symptoms. And number three uh, is going to be people who have symptoms and are getting short of breath. And those are the people we really need to worry about. So let's just focus on the first two groups of people first. People who don't have symptoms or people who might have symptoms of it but aren't short of breath. So what should you do? And <clears throat> out of all these people, these groups, this group of people right now, people who don't have symptoms or people who have symptoms without shortness of breath, these are the ones that are going to have the biggest impact on keeping our country safe and saving a whole lot of lives. Because what you do is going to have uh, huge consequences to the other group of people that are having shortness of breath and issues, okay? And so what you should do is absolutely nothing. <laughs> I know that sounds a little weird, but here's the deal. What you shouldn't do is go directly to the emergency room. That's probably the worst thing you could do. Um, second worst thing you could do is go to an urgent care. Uh, and, and then another thing you could do that'd be bad is go out to large groups of people. Okay, and why is that? Well, number one, let's say you do have the virus um, and you're not short of breath. You're going to go to the ER and there's nothing they can really do for you. Okay, it's a virus. There's not medication they can prescribe to you. It's going to make things better. It's just going to be mainly you waiting for it to go away on its own. But what are you doing when you do that? Well, number one, you're taking up hospital resources that could be used for people who are um, having shortness of breath and having respiratory issues. And that's the main thing. What's going to kill people, it's not so much that the virus can't be managed. It's just that if we overwhelm our healthcare system by everyone showing up, um, to the hospital, then the people who actually need care are not going to be getting taken care of. And so if you see these places like, for instance, in Italy right now, where they just had a mass outbreak and everyone just flooded there, the re reason people are dying is because they haven't been able to get managed appropriately because of lack of resources. We probably have resources to handle everyone if everyone acts appropriately, okay? And so if you're not having shortness of breath, um, then just stay at home, uh, isolate yourselves, you know, drink, do some chicken soup, things like you would do with normally if you're sick. Now, let's say you start to get short of breath. What should you do? <clears throat> well, if it gets to be where you can't breathe very well, then you do need to be seen. Because the way this virus works, especially in the elderly, that seems to be, and people who are immunocompromised, so that would be people who have had uh, organ transplants and they're on immunosuppressant drugs, people that have rheumatological um, problems like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus that are on uh, biologic agents that weaken their immune system. <clears throat> These people can get something called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and that's it, a, it's a byproduct of this, of this virus. There are a lot of other problems too, but it's mainly acute respiratory distress syndrome. What does that mean? What does that mean is that the little, at the bottom of your lungs, there's these things called alveoli. And they're little sacs that sit in the bottom of the lungs, and that's where the air moves in when you breathe. And that's where all these capillary beds are embedded in your system, and it allows oxygen to transfer from the air you breathe into your bloodstream, and also allows um, carbon dioxide to be pulled back in so you can breathe it out. Okay, so it's all about oxygen and carbon dioxide air exchange. <clears throat> so when you get acute respiratory distress syndrome, the lung will start to swell and get kind of edematous. It gets swollen 
and the surfactant, which is a fluid that sits in those alveoli that allows the chemical process to occur where oxygen exchange happens, gets diluted out or a barrier comes in between that. And then oxygen is not able to be exchanged. So even though you're able to breathe appropriately, you're not able to put oxygen into your blood. And so that causes problems. And so what happens when you come to the hospital and this is going on is you might need to be put on a ventilator for a few days and have the ventilator kind of work the breathing and push extra oxygen into those tissues. And there are certain ventilatory um, methods that can be used. There's research on this where they use something called PEEP, where they allow to keep the, they kind of give you little small um, breaths as opposed to deep in big, large tidal volumes like things like that, because that can cause more damage in there because you're stretching those tissues out and then cause them to collapse and it causes them to become more swollen in edematous. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, get a little coffee there. Um, and that can cause problems. And then also there's some studies that show that they actually can ventilate you on your belly, uh, that the survival rate uh, goes up quite a bit. And so let's, let's say you're one of these people that get put on the ventilator. What, what's your chance of survival? Well, right now we know if we use the uh, you know, up-to-date modern medical techniques and what studies show, you're probably looking at about an 85% survival rate. So what does that mean? That might mean you need to look at, if you're someone who has an advanced directive, for instance, or like a living will, and you have on there you don't want to have any type of ventilatory support uh, if you were to die, you might want to change that right now during this time because this is something that if you were to get put on a ventilator, there's a very high probability you're going to be coming off in a few days. It's just kind of a support thing. It's not like you've died and they've got you on like quote unquote life support. You're just being helped out until the virus is able to run its course. So that's a little tip too. If you're someone who has, has kind of told family members or you have it written down somewhere that you don't want to be put on a ventilator or something were to happen to you, you might want to take that off and say, let people know, hey, in this particular instance, I might, I, I feel pretty good about being ventilated because I'm going to be okay. So that's kind of the worst case scenario if you were to get sh really short of breath and you had to show, show up to the hospital, okay? So kind of showed you what the worst case scenario is. For everyone else that's doing, you know, that they get symptoms or not symptoms, just use common sense. Stay at home. If you have a question, call your doctor. Don't try to show up to your doctor's office because uh, if you do that, your healthcare provider's office, because you might get exposed to something else which will then weaken your immune system. You know, we have people that have strep throat or the flu, um, GI bugs, especially urgent care. You get exposed to all sorts of things and those people are getting inundated right now with all sorts of stuff anyway and we don't really have a whole lot of testing uh, available anyway and so my whole thing is why even test because it's not going to change what you do really the only people who probably need to be tested are the ones who are getting short of breath uh, so they know exactly what type of treatment they need to have you know if it's just the regular flu we can give you Tamiflu or things like that but if it's something like the COVID-19 then it's going to require <clears throat> being watched and possibly admitted to the hospital. So I um, hope that answers some of your questions. Uh, the, this is a time where, like I said, a lot of you, the vast majority of people out there can do a whole lot to help uh, the response that we have here in the United States to where we're not getting overwhelmed uh, like a lot of other countries have where we have mass people flowing into the hospital and then overriding the system to where the people who actually need the help can't get it because it's just not there because they can't weed through and triage all these people that are coming in. So um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to shoot the office a call or shoot us an email, give us a call. And um, yeah, hope this was informative and stay safe, wash your hands, uh, hang out, play some board games with your family, and let's just uh, hunker down and ride this thing out. Dr. Scott Nall from the Village Osteopath and have a great day.